Welcome back. Hope you had a good spring break. Um, <clears throat> so last time I tried, we started talking about contact. Uh, my favorite way to introduce that is to talk about sort of the, the dynamics of passive dynamic walkers. So we got to, to play with those systems. My goal was to introduce, uh, well, the notion of limit cycles, but also this, the, the, some very basic introduction to how we model contact and what that does to change our problem. Suddenly we have this discontinuous event when our foot hits the ground, even for a rimless wheel, it takes some care to, to get that right. The rimless wheel is a special case where we could, we could understand things uh, analytically. So the next phase of understanding to deal with contact is to, to understand some of the simple controllers that people have written around contact. Just like we did this in the, the non-contact case, we sort of did the, the dynamics of Pendula and the like, and then we did Mark Spong swing up controllers, and then we talked about numerical solutions that could do to reproduce some of those results. And we're going to do exactly the same thing here. So today we're on to simple control for legs. Uh, we talked about passive dynamic walking last time. So this time we're going to do Raybert's controllers for, for running, basically, and some of the running and hopping controllers. So uh, I'll use running as an example for. To motivate these, uh, you know, these topics today, it's actually sort of interesting to think about running versus walking. The, the approaches have tended to be fairly separate, although the, some of the computational approaches unify them. Uh, <clears throat> Naively, you might think that, that well, maybe not even naively, I, I would still sort of, I'm sort of surprised that it seems like running should be harder than walking. But actually, if you look at the history of legged robots, the running robots, running in terms of, you know, spring legs and the like, they're a little bit more like hopping than running, but if you're, as long as you lump that into running, the hopping robots, the running robots, actually worked pretty well before the walking robots did. So. I guess there's a couple reasons for that. I think um, you know maybe it was the hopper was a beautiful way to 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 make a system that was fairly simple but very dynamic running robot, uh, and it took longer maybe to build articulated legs that were enough for walking. It's harder to walk with a one link leg. Uh, <clears throat> not impossible, but I I do think there's something else going on there. I think there's somehow. The running case, as we'll see, is sort of, you can think about the energetics of pushing off the ground and, 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 and keeping your center of mass. We're going to tell that story in details. Um, it, it seems to get around some of the subtleties of controlling contact forces over a duration while you're walking. Uh, so somehow, in the, somewhere in the details, running turned out to sort of be easier, I think, than walking. And it's kind of a fun place to start with our control ideas. Many of these control ideas have uh, analogies now in walking robots, and we'll see some of those uh, in, a, in a little while. OK. Um, who knows what running is? Uh, in a precise way. What's the definition of running? At one point, there's uh, both feet are off the ground. That's definitely one of the definitions of running. So, uh, so I'd say there's the existence of an aerial phase. There's actually a fun story about that. Do you guys know the story about that? Um, Moybridge's story? Oh, the horses? The horses? Exactly. So um, Leland Stanford of Stanford University, he was the governor of California at the time. Apparently he, um, he had a bet with some of his friends about whether the horses at the track were actually, was there ever a time when they were trotting or galloping where all the legs were off the ground? And Back then, you know, the legs moved fast. It was impossible to tell, and so they had a standing bet. So he actually commissioned a guy, Edward Moybridge, who was a photographer and a murderer, I think, but that's not part of the story. Um, but uh, I've read that somewhere else, too, and it kind of destroyed my hero. But um, 
uh, yeah, so he, he, gave, he gave this guy like relatively a lot of money to try to solve this paradox for him and, and to try to resolve the bet. And Moybridge developed a new system, which maybe is the, the foundation of, of modern motion pictures, where he did sort of stop animation, uh, you know, uh, photography, and found and had horses running. In fact, I took a picture. I brought a picture here. There you go. There's the horse in motion. One of the first pictures by Edward Moybridge, uh, where he took horses and had them run in front of graph paper, basically, and took very high-speed photography and proved, without a doubt, that there's an aerial phase in that horses running. So that's kind of fun. So by the definition, number one, that horse is certainly running. But then as you, um, Oh, Moybridge, by the way, went on to then take this kind of photography uh, of all kinds of different animals and people and all other. There's great collections of his of his prints that are in uh, bound books. I have a couple of the volumes in my office, and it's it's really interesting to see the gates of all the different animals. <clears throat> Okay, but if you start looking across the animal kingdom or even just across Hollywood, let's say, there's, there's some cases where uh, that definition of running becomes a little bit ambiguous. Like, uh, I guess one of the classical ones is Groucho Marx. Do you guys know who Groucho Marx is? Yeah, so Groucho Marx used to run around without an aerial phase. Like they, there's actually, the, the running people call it Groucho running, right? So I'm, I'm gonna fall over my, you know, but you know, some, something like, he used to you know, go like this, right? All over the place, and he never actually had an aerial phase. But uh, he was running, and you know, uh, comedy ensued. Um, so, so it, when you started to look more at the more subtle cases, you know, people weren't sure if this was the right definition for running. And there's another definition that gets a little bit more mechanical about it, which is about the exchange of energy in, uh, of you know, the exchange of energy between your body and the ground. So, um, so roughly speaking, the idea is that if you have a foot, if your center of mass goes over, like vaults over your leg, like a pendulum, like an inverted pendulum, this is walking. And in running, if you watch the center of mass trajectories, then people tend to compress their legs during running and come back out. And in fact, the exchange is flips sign, if you will. The center of mass tends to go down and then back up. Okay, so the, there's an inversion in the exchange of kinetic and potential energy, which has become the more technical definition of running versus walking. But again, there's of course there's still exceptions to this one, and um, one of the funniest ones is there was actually a paper uh, in 2003 or something, a Nature paper, of of, uh, of someone at the Royal Veterinary College, uh, John Hutchinson. He actually he's, he makes theories about dinosaurs, but he also studies land animals, and in this particular case, he was studying elephants and how do elephants run. I think I have a video of that. Okay, so what do you do if you want to study elephants running? Well, you get really big mocap markers, right? Do you see that? <laughs> Those are sort of comically big mocap markers, and then you have them run in front of a high-speed camera, and then you start asking the questions. You know, what are their, uh, are they, does, is there an aerial phase? I think not, I think was the answer. But the more interesting part was, are they you know, walking or running by this definition? What do you think? Can you see it in that? Do elephants actually get up a cliff? They move pretty fast, considering how massive they are. Are they walking or are they running? Jogging. <laughs> what was it? They're jogging. They're jogging. Okay, was that like a flat line or something? <laughs> what do you think? Are they in center mass going over or under? It turns out they're back legs are running and their front legs are walking. So, I mean, I th yeah, and the theory is roughly that, uh, you know, this helps with the load bearing. 
because they're heavy. Um, and then, you know, but somehow this gives them the propulsive force to do that kind of speeds. Okay. There's also, I, I know some biomechanics folks that work with elephants, and it's actually, uh, everybody I've known that worked with an elephant like that comes away changed, right? They, they actually say that these, these animals are incredibly smart and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, I have not seen that. I've not seen that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, the test needs to be done, clearly. Okay, so, um, yeah, so elephants maybe are the place where, yeah, they, they were willing to say that, in summary, they were going to say that the animal was, in fact, running uh, because there was a total, um, you know, center of mass movement that looked like this. But the answer was sort of more subtle if you looked at in each individual half of the elephant. Okay, um, but we're going to dig in, and of course the tool of choice uh, in this class is to try to find a simple model that we can do on the board, but actually which has guided much of the research in the field, honestly, is these simple models. The simple models have a lot of value. They really, I think they help you think clearly about the problem, um, but it's been surprising actually how much the simple models play out uh, in implementations on real robots. <clears throat> So the simple model of, of, of running is the spring-loaded inverted pendulum. So we're gonna have our mass here, we're gonna have our leg just like this. This time now we'll, we'll put a spring in the, in the leg. I think I am. Let me get my letters right here. This thing has initial length L0, mass M here, some spring constant K. We'll have a angle theta. And we'll talk about the XY position of the mass. So again, a point mass at the hip. This time we're gonna have a massless leg. Okay, which is a major simplification. We'll get back to that. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll list more of the assumptions in a second. So the history, of the, 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 the story behind this model is also interesting. So it came up, I guess, with the initial ideas that maybe walking is vaulting and running looks something like this, where there's an exchange like this. Um, so they asked, I think the, the biology motivated these models initially. Um, but then there's been lots of work on in robotics using these models, understanding the properties of these models. But a continued work actually on, uh, on the biology side of understanding to what extent this model really describes real uh, animals. <clears throat> and there's a sort of whole group of people that study the spring-loaded inverted pendulum model. By the way, this is SLIP for short, the SLIP model. Um, and a lot of them are biologists. And, and uh, well, there, there's these fringe biologists that are engineers and biologists. And Bob Full is, is maybe the, um, the best example of that. And he talks about uh, slip models in something he calls comparative biology. And one of the amazing things about this slip model is that it actually, um, he studied animals of uh, lots and lots of different animals and asked to what extent can their center of mass trajectories and foot, you know, relative to their foot and even ground reaction forces um, from real data of real animals be explained as a spring-loaded inverted pendulum. And the answer is surprisingly that this, that this model gives a lot of insight into a, a huge range of animals. And so he, he's got a paper that, that talks about, um, he's got from 1e to the minus 3, which is a cockroach, all the way up to a 135 kilogram horse that are all, he recorded the gates of all these different animals, watched their center mass trajectory, watched their foot, footprint, and, and argued that this model actually describes their behavior very, very well across huge scales. To the point where the biologists start to argue that maybe this is not just um, 
you know, a toy model that's useful for thinking, but it, maybe it's under, it, it's, it's sort of a fundamental principle of movement that is being found by looking at lots of different animals that have very different gates, like, you know, very different modes of locomotion, different numbers of legs, you name it. But in all of them, you see a very characteristic trajectory of their center of mass. And so, so maybe there's something uh, deep about that. So here's his plot in one of their papers. Spring-loaded and very pendulum at the top, see? Cockroaches, some of them are trotting, some of them are running, some of them are hopping, their gates are different, their numbers of legs are different. But what's really amazing is the relative, it's not just that they can be described, by a spring-loaded inverted pendulum, but actually the characteristic stiffness of that, you know, the Ks, is sort of relatively, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dimensionless version of K, but it's relatively constant across a huge range of species. So there's this maybe a different, deeper understanding of these simple models, which is that maybe they're discovering something fundamental about biology and the right way to move. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But we're going to use them to get our head around how do you write controllers for, for robots. And you'll see actually at the end that, they, that those simple controllers that were designed for simple models have actually seen a lot of success even on very complicated systems. I, I realized that I had one more cool plot in here, so just to not skip it. There's one of the interesting things about, um, about walking and running is that uh, people have studied the transitions between walking and running. And there's a sort of characteristic speed, which is, yeah, I, I, I remember it as 2.2 meters per second, which is when an average adult male transitions from walking to running. If you put them on a treadmill, you say, do whatever feels comfortable. You want to walk, you want to run, do your thing. And then you start speeding up the treadmill, and what, the question is, at what point do they switch from uh, walking to running? And it's sort of characteristically around 2.2 meters per second. And then there's a separate set of experiments where they say, I'm going to measure your energy consumption, which they do by putting a mask on and, and measuring your volume of oxygen consumed. It's not a great measurement, but it's a, you know, a, one of the better, less invasive measurements of energetics that you can use. So you put them on a treadmill, you ask how much energy they're using when they're walking. And you change the speed of the treadmill, and you ask them, say, you're, this time you're definitely walking. Uh, do, you know, whatever it takes, walk. And, and then you measure their energy consumed, and that's the power curve here. Uh, right? So this, the walking does a curve like this, and then you say, okay, now you're definitely running, and I'm going to change the, the speed of the treadmill, and you're definitely running, now you get that curve, and interestingly, people tend to change from walking to running. Their preferred change in walking to running is where those curves cross. So they're trying to choose whichever one is less energy, or more energy efficient, or less energy consuming, right? Cool, right? There's, there's deeper, you know, there's, there's deeper questions about that now too. Um, people have done studies about trying to confuse their. Um, so, so Max Donnellan's a great guy in uh, in. British Columbia, who's, who's been doing really subtle studies about trying to confuse your metabolic processes, understanding uh, energetics, and see if you can make people transition at different speeds in different ways. Uh, so there's a deeper understanding of that now, but the basic idea, the basic curve still holds, and it's pretty cool. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> let's dig in a little bit to the spring-loaded inverted pendulum. So the diagram tells you most of the story. We've got a point mass, we've got a massless leg. So what does that mean? What is that? So we're gonna pretend that you can control the length, the, the angle of your leg. Okay, so you've got a motor at your hip, let's say. But because the leg is massless, you can basically do that arbitrarily fast. You can just place the leg wherever you want instantaneously. We're going to get to a model in a minute that it has inertia in the leg. But for now, you can just teleport. So your control command is effectively what is your angle of your leg. Okay. should say not, not only directly, but instantaneously. Um, 
We've got a massless leg here and a spring, so our mat, we, we have a mat, including our being a massless toe. So why? Um, because I want to think about the interaction with the ground differently this time. Uh, we did only we assumed the collisions were perfectly inelastic last time, which is good for walking. Not so good for running, right? So running, we're going to make the opposite extreme. So we're going to assume that the collision is perfectly elastic. Okay, so all of the energy uh, that we put into the ground is returned to us. Uh, and so to make that sort of reasonable, you have a ma reasonable in a still non-physical way, but you have a massless toe with a spring between you. Uh, okay. So this means something sort of funny about the model. There's, a, there's an implication. Uh, that implies that energy is going to be conserved. Right, so, so the only way that we, we changed energy in the walking model, we went down a ramp. That was one thing. This is flat, by the way. So I should say that's a flat terrain. We gained energy by going down the ramp in the walker, and we lost energy with inelastic collisions that dumped energy into the ground. Here we've got elastic collisions, and we're not gaining any energy from the terrain. So we've got a model that is um, energy conserving, right? So you should, that should immediately ring some alarm bells if you're a mechanical person, because um, I'm presumably going to try to talk about stability of these models. And if we can't change the, st the energy of the system, what hope do we have of having a stable stability in our system? Typically, there's some amount of dissipation required to, to, under to understand stability. Let that, let that run around in your head a little bit, and we're going to watch for that when it comes up, because that's a little bit quirky, and we want to give it its due when it comes up. OK, um, but it's still sort of a hybrid model. In the way that we talked about last time, we have a, the continuous dynamics of the pendulum. OK, in this case, the con there's a continuous dynamics of flight. But now we have a different dynamic when we, inter when we start interacting with the ground. Now we suddenly have a new constraint where we're going to assume infinite friction. I should finish my assumptions here. So once the toe hits the ground, it's going to act like a pin joint until the leg returns to its rest length. So there's a maximum rest length of the spring. And then it's just going to leave the ground again. OK, so it's a hybrid model. Because the aerial phase is distinct, has different vector fields governing its equations, is giving it different equations governing its dynamics than during stance. When the foot's on the ground, you have a fundamentally different vector field that you flip it. And now you have to think about what is this system that has two different types of dynamics that are uh, are touching each other roughly. Does the leg get longer than the rest of in this model, no. We're going to say as soon as it hits the rest length, it's going to stop getting longer, although, it, and it's going to leave the ground. Doesn't that make us teach, like, so how do you guarantee that the maximum compression is going to point straight up? That's right? No. It's more subtle than that. So the, the question was, I think the question was that uh, you'd like to have the maximum compression when the leg is straight up, like this? Like, so, like, so it's, yeah, so that there's a symmetry between the compression and the actual angle of the leg. That's exactly what we're going to dig into that, I promise. Yep. OK, so um, it turns out that you can make these things hop around. And if you start simulating them forward, you can imagine how you'd write the equations of motion. I won't write them all on the board here, but um, you know, during the aerial phase, there's just a point mass flowing through the air. You can write that pretty easily. That's just the ballistic trajectory of the point mass. When you're on the ground, you now just have a spring, uh, you know, a, an inverted pendulum with a spring. You can write the equations of motion. It'll bounce around. And in fact, when you simulate this, 
it appears to have a stable limit cycle, right? So if it starts hopping fast, it slows down. If it starts hopping too slow, it'll speed up a little bit within limits. And it, 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 it finds itself into a stable, well, I, guess I want to be care a little bit careful of stable limit cycle because of this, but it, it, it converges to a solution that is periodic, okay? Crazy. So let's dig in a little bit to how we understand that stability. So you can't quite solve this one in closed form, but almost. Um, so let's think about the, the basic Poincaré analysis. The return map analysis. So the, what is the state space of this model? So I have the x, y, this is my you know, state vector here. I've got the x, y position of the center of mass. Um, I've got the angle of the leg, which even though I can control it instantaneously, uh, let me just include that in the state for a moment here. And then I have the velocities of those, right? So I've got a six dimensional system, which I claim, if I run it forward, seems to come to a cycle. So can we use Poincaré analysis to try to understand that cycle? Yeah. What does it mean to be able to control the angle of the leg instantaneously when it's on the ground and there's friction? Good. You can only control the leg when you're in the air. I should have said that, yes. Absolute or relative to X is absolute, but uh, either model could work. Yeah. And right in, in the simple things I'll write on the board, it's absolute. So what's the relationship between X and Y and the length of the leg? Um, it's going to come from, so, so I think you'll see. I, I promise you'll see. So, but the first question I want to ask is just where should we draw our surface of section? Right? Do you remember the basic story of limit cycle analysis? Uh, I've got a cycle. It's doing something complicated. The Vanderpool oscillator was doing something like this. Right? I might not even have an analytical solution for that limit cycle, but I can turn the stability analysis of a cycle into the stability analysis of a fixed point if I just, I didn't bring my extra colors, but if I draw some surface of section and I ask what is the dynamics on this section, which is now a discrete time dynamics, uh, from one, if I'm in this place and I simulate it all the way around and I visit this place again, right? If, there, if that discrete time system has a stable fixed point for the discrete time system, then that tells us something about the stability of the continuous time system that generated it, okay? So what do we, we, for the Vanderpool oscillator, we picked this. For the rimless wheel, we picked the immediately post impact. Um, as, a, as the state that we started doing rimless uh, analysis on, what should we pick for the Poincaré analysis? And it would be helpful if you could pick one that I could plot on the board. So there's a trick, okay, because this looks very high dimensional and very hard to, to think about. But uh, as we said, so the, you know, if we assume that the leg is massless, then these things are sort of irrelevant to the dynamics, right? I can control them directly. Relevant. Okay. And even the cycle that I'm talking about is a cycle in the sort of um, Muybridge sense. If I if I if I think about the system. Uh, going through one set of the trajectories, of course x is going to move forward every time, so I'm going to ignore x, but I'd like to have a cycle in all the other variables, right? Does that make sense? It's a l I actually don't like sweeping that under the rug, but that's what people do, um, right? So, because it's technically not a fixed point of the whole system if I'm moving forward, but it's a... Um, it's tracking a, a stable solution. Okay, so now we, got, we still have a three-dimensional system to think about. What's the trick? Okay, well, 
the, the, the place that it works out really well is to do um, the apex to apex map. Okay, so if I think about the, the robot at its highest point in its, in its trajectory, okay, then um, until the next time it goes up, then uh, this by, def by definition is zero. Still got two variables. And the last observation here is that is that the energy is conserved in this model. So whatever energy I started the whole simulation with, I know it's going to be constant forever, <clears throat> which means if I know the height, if I know either one of these, I have to know the other one. Right? So energy, which in this case is a function at the apex, um, is a function of y and x dot is a constant. So if I, if I know y, I can figure out what x dot must have been. So in this particular system, there's a magical place to draw the Poincaré map, the surface of section. If you choose the apex, then you can write the whole Poincaré map simply as a function of the height. Okay? Yeah? Does total energy also include y dot? Or is it just for this like apex to apex? You don't worry about that? So at the point of the apex, then y dot is zero. Yeah. Okay. So therefore it doesn't contribute. Okay, so that's only at the point where, where it's not moving uh, in the y direction. Yep, it's, it's when it's cresting and about to go back down. Yeah. yeah. Should it also include the energy in the spring? Yeah, absolutely. The total energy includes the energy in the spring. So we're going to assume that the apex is off the ground. Okay. Yeah, so it's at the rest length. Uh, how do you know the sine of x dot? Because you can get x dot squared. Good. Yes. So um, you can solve x dot up to a sine. I actually have that. I was about to write that. x dot up to a sine. Yeah. Um, so, but if you're moving forward, then we'll just take the positive solution in this case, in this analysis. So what this set of tricks allows us to do is to, to write the Poincaré map as, as a function y is some Poincaré map of yn. Right? So for this system, if I know that I have a particular y, which is the apex of my current trajectory, and I know my total energy, then just knowing this y, I can tell you how the system's going to evolve com completely down to collision, it's going to go through its stance phase. It's going to come back up until it crests again. And I can, just as a function of that y, I can solve that entire, I can run that entire simulation. And I can plot the Poincaré map. Okay, so um, what's interesting is that that Poincaré map is going to depend on my, now, you know, the rimless wheel didn't really have a control input. Uh, this Poincaré map could have a control input. So what I'm going to do for a control assume it changes once per cycle right now. Or you can even just assume it's constant, but but yeah, let's just assume it's constant but first. But I can think of this as a map that depends on my control parameter alpha. 
and I can ask questions. If I change the, the angle of attack of the leg, what does that do to change the, um, the solution I get of, of the simulation? Okay, so I won't um, do all the derivations, but I want you to understand, I want you to believe that you could go and just under, like believe that you could write down the, the solution if you wanted to. So if you wanted to simulate this forward, given Y, right, so there's the flight phase first. So you're given Y, N, you can solve for X dot, um, X we can you can just set arbitrarily to zero, and then you can just the vector field of course is just the ballistic trajectory of the center of mass. So you can figure out not only um, you know how the, how x and y evolve over time, but you can also ask. When does the, you, know, you can, because you can solve that in closed form, you can also ask at what time and at, you know, at what position do I collide with the ground, right? It's when my, my fully extended leg hits the ground, which is a function of alpha. Right? And you can figure out what the collision time is and what the, the collision, so let's call this uh, time of collision, and you can solve for all of the variables x at the time of collision. The stance phase is a little bit more subtle. It's not just ballistic trajectory of a point mass. I'm going to assume that this is uh, frictionless, and it's going to start doing something like this. Frictionless or slipless? I'm oh, sorry, f f infinite friction, slipless. That's horrible. I can't say slipless. <laughs> right? Infinite friction. Infinite friction. Um, okay, so I can write down the equations of motion for this, or you can throw it in your favorite rigid body dynamics algorithm. I've got a, a spring with an initial rest length, which I know the state variables inside here now include the dimension. So I have x, y, l which is my current length of my, um, of my uh, spring. I've got theta. These are coupled. That it's not actually that high dimensional because there's a constraint that couples them. But you could think about it sort of like this, okay? X dot, y dot, l dot, theta dot. And I can write the solution of this as I go forward. In fact, you could just write it in terms of the minimal parameterization would be inside stance would just be to write it as R um, or uh, L and theta. And then L dot theta dot. So I can come up with the initial um, values of L, theta, L dot, and theta dot from my ballistic calculation. And then I can run a forward simulation of this simple system to figure out when L returns to L to the, to the rest length of the spring, at which point it turns off, or it, it lifts off, and I go back to the ballistic, and I can solve for the apex again. Okay? So the mechanics of simulating that system, I think, are, are straightforward. The um, subtlety is, can I write down the equations in closed form? Uh, and the answer is not quite, because it's hard to integrate this system to that terminal condition of L equals L theta. L zero, I mean, okay. But 
if you were to just make a small angle approximation of it, then you can. Then it becomes a linear system, linear spring mass system. So where I'm going to just approximate it with a uh, linear approximation. Okay. So. And this, um, the closed form solution, given the small angle approximation, uh, I saw that first from Parker Geyer, who's uh, on the faculty at CMU now. That was his master's thesis, I think. <clears throat> okay, if you do that, you can imagine writing the equations, and I've done it, uh, from apex to the next apex, and then plotting this function what is p given some alpha, okay? And it's fun to see what that ends up looking like. And it gives you some insights, I think, into the questions you were asking. invite you to do this for yourself, but for a particular set of parameters, um, sort of a reasonable touchdown angle, a reasonable initial energy of the system, uh, you'll get something like this. Remember, the in the discrete time systems, it's not the, the x-axis that's important, it's the line of slope one that's important. Right? curve looks something like this. Okay, this is one particular for some sort of energy constant. For my favorite, how about that? My favorite energy and uh, alpha. Okay, so there's two places where it crosses the axis. Are they stable or unstable fixed points? This one's easier to think about, okay? Remember, the way you do this is this iterated map business that nobody likes when I describe it the first time. I probably have to describe it better. But you go like this, go like this. And in this case, if the line is above here, it's just going to do, 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 and go off to infinity. So if every time I, I have a yn, the next yn is bigger, then I'm just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. Okay. And this one, if I have a yn and the next yn is smaller, then I'm going to move this way. So it's going to kind of go this way, but it's not a, I don't want to draw, draw it as a flow because it's not quite that, but it, it's almost like that. The problem, the reason I don't want to draw it as like arrows like this is because um, it can jump discontinuously. Or the flow actually med, in the continuous time, it actually, if it's going here, it'll, it'll end up there. This one, in fact, this one will do, it, do that, right? So if I'm here, I can go here. I can then, on my next step, go here. And then here, here, and this one actually converges. Right, so the, if I go a little faster here, but then when I, once I've gone faster, I go slower, and this one will actually land and be a stable fixed point. So 
So I just said stable fixed point, right? I just want to caveat that this, and people talk about stability of these systems, it's, it's not a real stability because there is still energy um, is assumed to be constant here. If I were to perturb this system in a direction that increased the energy, it would end up on a new neighboring orbit that had whatever that energy was, okay? But given the, the assumption that energy is fixed, then this is a, this is a stable, in the other variables it's stable. Okay, which is actually so surprising in some sense that um, the, the classical dynamics people got excited about it. They, they started talking about um, piecewise holonomic systems. Because you know the people who study orbital mechanics and the like, they never get to think about stability. And they said, when they saw this, these systems, they said, well, there's no energy being lost. Uh, there's nothing to talk, there's stability that shouldn't enter the conversation. And then the fact that this sort of thing happens got them very interested and they said, oh, there's a, there's a whole sort of nice set of, of papers by uh, Guckenheimer and Holmes and the, these folks saying, oh, piecewise holonomic systems have additional st stability property systems that no holonomic system could, could ever have. So there's something fundamental about the fact that this is a hybrid system that allows this kind of thing to happen. But we don't have to get into the details. In practice, I run the simulation, I see this, okay? Um, all right, so, so what happens over here? Let me see I, make sure I get this right. So there's a nominal, um, well, let's see what happens at the fixed point. So at the fixed point, as you said, there's a nice sort of symmetry that happens, right? Where I come in and I sort of leave in this nice symmetric uh, way, and I'm at my stable hopping solution, okay? What happens if I come in too low? If my apex is lower than the nominal fixed point? Yeah, so it's kind of subtle because given the energy constraint, if I'm coming in low, it means I'm also coming in fast, okay? And what happens is you end up doing, you, you get more, you know, so you get you go higher on the next one, which is what the plot says. But in, the reason for that is it's kind of, you have your spring coming in low and fast, and your solution goes woof and comes off like this, right? And you gain a lot of height. And then this, if you're going too fast, you lose energy because you come, sorry, if you if you're start off too high, then you come in slow, and then you end up, let's see, if I come in slow, then I'll, I'll go off more this direction. This is an extreme version of that, okay. And somehow these things trade off and there's a stable sweet spot and it's, and it's stable up to that asterisk. It's awesome, right? Yeah. What's the physical intuition for why it comes with a high height? Why it would go faster on the on the next? Uh... If it comes in with a high height, then it also is moving slowly. Yes. So when it comes in, it's not gonna. Um, let's see. It's gonna go more down, and then. I don't know what's the physical intuition. There's there's a spring here, and you've sort of come in like this, and it it leans across faster, and, you know, and, and shoots it off this way. Oh, because the high height means it's a spring compressed more. That's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's a spring mass system on an angle, you know, on a pivot. It's um, I don't have a magical way to say that, but I think that's what happens. Um, okay, so uh, so that's cool. So there's this sort of stability property. Now up here, you should you should ask yourself what's happening up here, uh, and and I don't have a status. This is where the model starts getting a little funny. Um, It's funny because if you come in with, um, if you put all of your energy into height, then you come in with basically no velocity, then you can start actually failing to return to the Poincare map, right? So you can come in like this and then you go 
poof, and fall off, shoot off the way you came. And so, yeah, don't read too much into that part of the curve. At some point, there's actually, I, I should be able to tell you the point where it no longer makes sense. It no longer returns to the bunker right now. Cool? So there's a simple model of running the it, given an angle, a constant angle in the aerial phase, you understand now how this works, right? So, so when I'm in the air, I'm allowed to move my leg arbitrarily. When I'm on the ground, it's true that the Earth is resisting. Uh, there, you know, I can't I'm even infinite. Yeah, it's no longer a massless leg because I have the mass of the Earth attached to me, roughly. Um, so when I'm in the air, ding, if I if I always pick the same angle, then I come to a, a stable so, stable solution. Now, the, 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 there's there's an interesting question about uh, control. So if I want to now make a control decision, then I could say, well, what if alpha is my control input? And having the machinery of the Poincaré map, of course, uh, a richer uh, real world, I would have to make control decisions sort of uh, along the entire, at every instant in time. But there's a nice sort of obvious abstract model decision here where you could say, what if I made my control decision exactly once per cycle? When I'm at the apex, I choose my next touchdown angle and I'll keep it fixed. Then I can use these equations to figure out what happens next and I can ask the question of, of, of how can I stabilize it better? Right, and this is going to be our first example of control through contact. How does the energy conservation work when you're using energy to change the angle of the system? So you have a massless toe. <laughs> oh, right. You get to move. You get to move your leg without changing the energy. Yeah, it's standard. Okay. Yeah, it's a weird assumption, right? There's a joke of. Uh, yeah, so, so Andy Ruina likes to say, you know, for a while we were talking about, you know, assume a spherical cow. And then, and then he came back the next year and he said, no, no, that's wrong, it's too hard. Point mass cow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what we do, you know, but, uh, but you get to think about it. So I could have shown this video earlier. It was thematically connected to when I was talking about biology, but I figured, oh, I'll put a couple of equations up and then I'll show them the really fun movie. Okay, so, so um, these models really do describe what happens in biology, even those return maps and the like, and the stability properties that ensue, okay? So the best example of that ever, in my mind, is a set of experiments that Devin Jindrich did when he was working with Bob Full, okay? And he wanted to understand the stability properties of a real animal if it was under the, the spring mass model, okay? Uh, it's interesting, so I, I've only talked about it as a, a, as a vertical model, but they also believe that in the, in the cockroach, for instance, that it also describes the lateral stability of the system. So a, a, a cockroach has a sprawled gait, and if you, um, they, they move side to side as if they've got springs connected to the ground in a characteristic spring mass kind of way too. Okay, so then the question became, um, what does the stability of that gate look like? Which, which forces the question, how do you perturb a cockroach, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, and, and, and even better, they wanted, to, um, they wanted to measure the ground reaction forces of a cockroach, which is a pain, because they're small, right? So, so, how do you, so they actually invented this whole type of technology where, where they basically had the cockroach run on jello, um, and they, they, they put uh, you know, some, some, some different gratings on top and, and basically projected light through, and if the, the surface of the jello moved, then it would, diffract, it would cause the light to diffract in a different way, and they could use light to sense the forces up to some resolution, okay? Which was awesome and brilliant. And I guess apparently the cockroaches ate the jello sometimes. <laughs> Especially orange is what Devin told me, but orange jello is their favorite. Um, so, oh, anyway, so they've got this great experiment where they've got cockroaches running on, on, you know, and they can measure their ground reaction forces. The question is, how do you perturb the cockroach? And apparently, they tried a lot of things before they made the video that I'm about to show. Um, you know, tie a little string, boop, but, but the problem is, <laughs> Cockroaches are really fast. Like the, the dynamics of their gait is really fast. So you, it was very hard to pull fast enough to, to upset the cockroach. So the, the obvious solution is... Um, whoa! <laughs> he said it's playing. Well, I set it up that much and now I've got it. Oh, come on. 
I'm going to open that up. Sorry, that's worth it. There it is. Okay. So what do you think that is? That's a cannon on the back of a cockroach. <laughs> okay. And we're, it's, a, it's sort of the world's tiniest cannon. Luckily, cockroaches are, uh, have exoskeletons, right? So you can just bolt the cannon to the cockroach, and that's pretty good. Um, okay, here we go. Ready? Cockroach is running. Spring mass dynamics and its lateral leg spring. Okay. Light the charge. Boom. There goes the cannonball. Yeah. In this case, the cannonball hit the wall and came back. That was the second perturbation. Okay. But then the series of experiments they were able to do with this <laughs> showed that the, the cockroach actually recovered. Um, so it recovered its angle in a few steps. You could see that. That was vis visible. But even within a single step, it was actually the, the, the heading, the, the velocity of the cockroach was, re was recovered within a single step. So there was a question about how much are they recovering with foot placement as a strategy versus the dynamics of their leg in sort of in one stride. And it seems that they recover their heading within a single stride. They even argued in the paper that it was faster than the neural response could have been. So it had to be a mechanical response that stabilized the cockroach. Right? Pretty cool. So, you know, these things, that sort of goes along with this notion that it's something fundamental about the, the mechanics of locomotion, that, you know, some of these stability properties happen faster than the controller could possibly have done. So, I, I, you know, I, I know Devin, I've met him a bunch of times. Um, I, of course, asked him, um, how did you know how much gunpowder to use? <laughs> and he said it took a lot of trial and error. <laughs> Which suggests to me that there were some initial experiments that was kind of like, poof, you know, right at the computer. But, but he, he, he never admitted to that much, but I, it had to happen. I mean, I, I know what experiments are like. Okay. Um, so, good, good reprieve from equations. Here we go into these some equations for a second. Um, all right, so how do we choose alpha? If we start thinking about control as the problem of choosing my step angle in order to stabilize a desired fixed point of my Poincaré map. Okay, that's the big idea here. Once I say it like that, it's easy, right? So now I just have a dynamical system, which is now yn plus 1 is some Poincaré map, yn alpha. Okay, and if I have a, my, linear, my small angle approximation, then I know p in closed form, so I actually have an expression for p. It's just a discrete time, one-dimensional dynamical system. I should write alpha n now, because I'm going to make control decisions. Okay. Um, even if it's numerical, some of our techniques can, can work. Okay, so if I have a desired then how do I stabilize it? Well, I had better make, you know, make sure that yn plus 1 equals yn at the fixed point. So I have to choose alpha for that. So I can just invert p to figure that out numerically or analytically. Um, and then how do I stabilize that? If let's say I wanted to, it to hop at a different fixed point than the one that the passive system would have done, right? Or the, the, the constant alpha. How can I change the stability properties of that? Well, I could, uh, I can even linearize P. Okay. 
and do LQR if I want, right? Or you could do dynamic programming. Or you could do a lot of the techniques we have in class work. Right? The, you know, this is discrete time LQR. So it's a little bit different. I mean, it's just slightly different equations, but it still works. And it's implemented in MATLAB, it's implemented in PyDrake, and you can call that. And given P, you can, uh, you can just call LQR and stabilize it. Right? So if in the specific case of this periodic solutions, the control through contact can be sort of hidden in the folds of this Poincaré analysis, right? As long as I'm not on the edge of, um, you know, so what, what could go wrong would be if P had some sort of kink in it because of the contact, for instance. If I had some solution like this and something like this, then, then maybe linearization might not work very well. But in fact, given our assumptions and our models, we don't have that problem. P is continuous. This could, you know, these things happen in contact systems. For instance, if uh, if you have a, a a grazing contact, or if you, let's say, I was, I have a finite table. Sorry to use your, your table as a prop here, but of course, if I'm hopping here and I had to go across stepping stones, for instance, right, and if if there's a neighboring solution which just misses the contact or goes and makes a completely different contact, then you get those sort of things. But in fact, the on a flat terrain, you know. Contact, even though it changes my velocity in the middle, the solution of simulating through contact is still uh, smooth, right? In this case. So if I change my initial conditions a little bit, I get that same little change on the output. So contact does not necessarily cause um, catastrophic changes in my solutions. <clears throat> and you could do, you could do. Um, you know, Lyapunov, you could do uh, value, value, so Lyapunov would require the, the closed form ver solution of P, um, unless you did a numerical version of the, the Lyapunov, you could do dynamic programming whatsoever. The question, um, but there's something else that can happen that's a slightly more elegant solution than anything we've talked about so far, because so far we've talked about continuous time systems, and in discrete time systems you could do something uh, that you can't do in continuous time systems. <laughs> What's that? You can get there in one step. You can get there in one step, right? So if I wanted to, to somehow get to my fixed point in a single step, in a continuous time system, that would mean infinite input. But in a discrete time system, I can take a fine, I can with a finite alpha arrive in a single step. Okay. And that idea is called deadbeat control. Is it actually obvious that you can do it in one step for this system? Um, it depends on the, the, the invertibility of P, right? Yeah, yeah of course. So, um, but in large ranges of initial conditions, you can. Certainly you can ask for things, you, know, you can go beyond the range of, of P being invertible. Okay, so with finite with finite alpha, I could achieve one step by just numerically inverting p. Again, this is something that's harder to do in high dimensions, but I could just go through and you know, sort of for all, I could just for all y go through and numerically try to invert p and figure that out. And people have done that. Okay. What's really cool is that. Um, there's a, sp a certain property that falls out. I'm going to just, maybe I'll just uh, storyboard this instead of deriving it. But um, it turns out that let's say you'd like to, to hop at a constant height, or the, you know, on each time you return, you'll, you, you have some desired height, okay? Uh, in absolute, sort of from the center of the earth to this height, I've got a, I've got a desired height. But let's say I don't know what the terrain is. So I don't know exactly when I'm going to touch the ground. It turns out that this solution is a nice function that's continuous, okay? And 
uh, you could add, you can if you solve let's say let's say what happens if the terrain was at this particular it was at was was two meters below my apex um, then what should alpha be what about if it was 2.1 meters below my apex what should alpha be and you could go through and solve those and those solutions are also continuous which uh, permits this incredible strategy of open loop rough terrain deadbeat control with this with this model so what you do is you just you know you, you know when you're at the at the top you don't know anything about the terrain but you take your leg through some angle so that whatever time my leg hits the ground it just happens to be at the deadbeat control solution for for when it comes back up okay you can schedule it like this and you can do blind hopping on rough terrain that is so good it's deadbeat Given, of course, if you have a massless leg and only mass at your hip, <laughs> right? So that's pretty cool. Um, and it looks like this. So you see his leg is going through a characteristic stride here every time down. And it goes lower, it goes higher, but the, in the world coordinates, it, it should be dead beat. The rendering doesn't make it look like that completely, but I think that's what it is. Why are my videos not playing all of a sudden? Um, yeah, so they made a little spring mass thing with, that did roughly the same thing. Okay. Even cooler is that um, you can take that and get closer to walking, just like we took the rimless wheel and we took away the extra spokes. You can do spring mass walking by taking the slip model, which is running, adding an extra leg, doing the same kind of tricks, and now you have spring mass walking. In fact, the you know since I've been in the field, the the this predominant model of walking as vaulting over the leg has sort of changed. I remember the year where everybody started saying, oh, you know what, there's a lot of springs involved in walking too, and we should be putting our springs in the walking part of the gate. And then this set of models came out. This is, again, Hartmut's stuff I'm, I'm focusing on today, but um, there's a couple different models that are like this that show that the same model can predict walking and running, just with spring mass, okay? So how do we get away from this massless leg assumption? So I, think, I feel like this one is, again, very satisfying. There's a sort of, you get to a point where once you have P numerically, you can do good control. You can do sort of amazingly good control. And even with terrain uncertainty and the like, you can do it, OK? But this is not a real robot yet. Uh, real robots have mass at their toe. They have, uh, it re requires energy to move your leg, all these other things. So the next. sort of place to go is Mark Rabert's hopping controllers. Okay, and these controllers, so I should, I mean, Mark, of course, was, was the lab PI. There was a whole bunch of people that worked on this in the, the leg lab at MIT. Uh, and Carnegie Mellon, it, the leg lab started at Carnegie Mellon, moved to MIT. They did a lot of this work uh, in the basement of NE43, if you know it. Um, okay, and you remember the videos of, these, of the hopping robots, right? This is the simplest hopper like this. And we can make a model which is almost, you know, it's not so far from the rimless wheel. In fact, the, its history was sort of tied up with the rimless wheel. So we're going to think about having a massive body now. So our body is not a point mass, but has some inertia. And a, um, a leg that also has some mass. Okay. And this angle matters now. And this angle matters now. And this matters, okay? Um, in practice, those robots look the way they do because uh, Mark and the leg lab were very, very clever to put a large inertia on the body. So there's a lot of, of cantilevered mass. 
so that you have a, a lot of inertia in the body so that when you're in the air and you move your leg, your body doesn't move that much. It stays roughly um, bubble and then and your leg moves a lot. And when you're in the ground, roughly, you're, again, this is too simple, but, but roughly the, the, you're, you now are able to control your body by applying uh, torques at the hip and your, and your leg continues to move, okay? <clears throat> so we can simulate this and I, I, I will in a second. Um, but the key insight is to take these sort of, um, you know, in fact, maybe I'd say the slip models were almost inspired by the controllers that Raybert did. He had a simple controller. Call it intuitive controller. Which broke the problem into um, you know, three parts. Said largely independently, I'm gonna control um, hopping height. relatively independently from body attitude. Relatively independently from foot position, foot placement. All right. So the idea was um, when I'm on the ground, I, I, have, I have my hip torque and the other thing I have is a pneumatic piston in the leg. Okay. That's another thing they did really well was they had a big hydraulic motor or a big hydraulic uh, actuator at the hip and then a pneumatic air piston in the leg. Why? Why would you use hydraulics in one and pneumatics in the other? Seems like a lot of wires to run, a lot of hoses to run. Maybe you need a lot of power here. You want a lot of power here, which is why hydraulics were the choice. But they actually use the air as a spring, right? So they they treated the this as an air cylinder that had a and they wanted this to be compressible, right? Okay, so um, so when you're on the ground, having a simple PD loop. Honestly, the, the great thing about the hopping controller is that it exists on a single page in Raybert's book. Like the whole hopping controller, I, feel, I use this as a standing example now in lab, but you know, we, have, we, we have optimization powerful tools that generate beautiful controllers. Um, none of them fit on a page of text, like a complete description of this controller with a picture for the state machine and the, you know, the text description, one page, right? So, um, so his body attitude is, is I've got to, I, I'd like to be roughly zero, uh, you know, roughly level, uh, although that's not quite true. You have to, you have to cheat it a little bit because the, the, the separation is not ideal. Okay, when I'm on the ground, I'm going to servo my, my body to try to make it level. When I'm in the air, I'm going to choose my foot placement and just servo my leg there. I'll tell you how they choose the foot placement in just a second. How do I control hopping height? Well, uh, if, I'm, if I'm just hopping in place, right, then the amount of energy I push into the spring is related to the how high I will go in some complicated way, which I could simulate, right? And I could try to write the equations for. Raybert's kind of like, eh, you know, if it's three, it hops this high. If I turn it up, it goes a little higher. So he just, it was, it was actually a constant that you would put in for your hopping height. And whatever hopping height you wanted, you just turn it up or down on a dial, right? So hopping height when you're standing in place is just a matter of how much, there's a single point in the trajectory where you, you've let the leg compress passively. And then right at this moment of, of, of takeoff, you, you put in a constant amount of energy with a scalar parameter that was set by a dial and you'd jump up and you'd, for whatever choice you made, you'd achieve a certain hopping height. The interesting one, the most interesting one maybe is the speed control, which if you look in Raybert's book, it has exactly these pictures of saying that there is a nominal foot placement, which for whatever speed I'd like, there's, and there's some, a simple model, even simpler model of what that equation could be. But the, again, the observation was, I don't care if, about the closed form solution. I know that if I choose a certain angle, there is a steady state solution for that. If I put my foot out ahead of that, then I'm gonna go like this. If I put my foot below here, then I'll go like this. So again, if his speed was, was um, slower, 
he would just put his foot back, put, put his foot down a little sooner. And he wrote a linear PD controller on the, the desired landing position. Close that with a PD, that same PD controller on the hip, and it all worked, right? So, I mean, it really worked, right? I showed, so. This is the, um, my simulation of it, which is not nearly as cool as his robot, but just to show you it works even in code, right? That's are the simple models, okay. Ah, why is this not working? Okay. Right, so uh, they had hoppers hopping over boxes, whatever, just thinking about very simple foot placement strategies. They had quadrupeds back in the day that were using this. The great paper that that, um, the title of that paper describing this was hopping on four legs as though they were one. And the, the solution was to basically think of the whole robot center of mass in a virtual foot that you would put down or you put down twice in the stride, depending on if you're doing bounding or trotting or, or whatever. Um, and the same math worked on each of those intervals and they would just interleave them to have two bounces or, or, or whatever, okay? If you ask, up till a couple of years ago, if you ask what, what's happening when you watch uh, Big Dog or, or Wildcat or, or any of these, you know, they would say, oh yeah, it's just the same old stuff. And uh, there's some truth to that. Uh, but this is in 1983, right? Crazy. And then this is, you know, more recent. dressed up and they get then they have a friend kick them like this and they fall over and it's all kinds of good stuff okay but roughly the story is that this controller this robot that worked incredibly well and sort of got everything going again in legged robotics uh, is doing roughly the happened it's a very simple understanding of where it should put its foot in order to stabilize its trajectory uh, they'll use slightly different words when we talk about it now. And they certainly have more numerical tools in the pipeline. But the foundation is the same. And the design is the same. And still, if you look at the labor, or if you look at all the Boston Dynamics uh, robots, it's still, I have to pause that, otherwise no one will listen to me. Um, it's still exactly like this. The reason that those robots are so amazing is that they have a lot of inertia in the body and almost no leg mass. That's the magic. And they have a ridiculously big power source you know, at the, at the hips, right? So effectively, the thing that they did right, I think compared to, I mean, they did a lot of things right. But the things that really stood apart in the mechanical design is that they could recover when somebody kicked them. That was Matt Melchano that kicked them. Um, you know, because they can move their leg almost arbitrarily fast. Not so different from our, our slip model. And that made the control and planning of those, of those systems dramatically easier. You could reduce those big complicated robots to simple center of mass foot placement models. And that is still the dominant controls approach for, for these quadrupeds and, and even bipeds now. Okay. Um, I'll just show the one more Boston Dynamics video and then maybe we'll have to call it. All right, you guys know Wildcat. And the newer ones are, are electric, right? So the newest videos of Spot and Spot Mini are electric. So this is still one of my favorites.
Questions? Great. So, for like cat like gates where the feet are together, then I can see pretty clearly how this extends. But what about for, I think most animals don't put their, uh, their, the like legs at the same time as other all the same time. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll, let's talk right afterwards since everybody's getting up. But, but galloping is, is a small perturbation on this. Yeah, that's right. All right, I'll see you Thursday.